So let's look at oxygen isotope now. Let's focus on oxygen isotope and talk about what happens in um, the ocean and why oxygen isotopes are so useful. And we'll start with the notion that oxygen isotopes fractionate in the system and are indicative of changes in, in the environment of deposition and the environment of diagenesis. So in this diagram here, what you can see is a, a representation of a continent and the ocean. It's absolutely not to scale. And of course, the ocean has a value of zero per mil smo. Okay, this is all expressed in smo here, even though it's uh, not explicitly written, the values here are in smo. Now in the tropical ocean, typically what happens is we have evaporation and evaporation essentially means that the water molecule needs to be taken from a liquid form, put into a vapor phase. So you have a change of phase. That's, that's really the important concept here, is the fact that we have a change of phase. Because every time we have a change of phase, we have fractionation of the isotopes. What does fractionation mean, uh, mean in this context? Fractionation means that you will not have the same isotopic ratio in your product than in your initial material because the physical chemical processes that take place are favoring one of the two isotopes. And typically when you have evaporation, what happens is you will more easily evaporate the lighter H2O molecule. So you will preferentially focus the molecule that have more O16 in the water vapor. So the clouds will end up with a delta O18 that is minus 10 per mil. That means 10 per mil depleted compared to the value of the ocean of smoke. Now, what's interesting is that the process doesn't stop there on the planet. What happened is this moisture is transported to the higher latitude and usually rain falls. And when rain falls, it's a reverse process of evaporation. Now it's condensation. And that means that the heavier uh, molecule in the cloud tend to end up in the rain droplets. So you concentrate the delta 18 or the, the O18 um, molecule into the rain. So the rain now has a value of minus three per mil. It's still negative compared to the ocean, but it's more positive than the cloud. And the cloud is of course more negative. And the vapor now is maybe at minus 15. And so when you transport it, this, this vapor to the high latitude and you have precipitation coming from this, lat this water again, it will again be more positive than the water vapor, but more negative than the previous precipitation. In fact, it will be at minus five per mil. Now you can see that this will have an impact on the planet because most of the evaporation is taking place in the tropical zone and the precipitation then happen all along the different latitudes. And this is why if you look at current ice in Antarctica or in the Arctic, it's extremely depleted in O18. It has value of delta O18 anywhere between minus 40 to minus 50, minus 60 per mil. So much, much uh, lighter, so that means less O18 than the ocean. That has implication over geological time scale. You can very well imagine that this process known as Rayleigh distillation essentially means that the more ice we have, the more O16 is concentrated on the continental ice. And so by default, the less O16 there is in ocean. So the delta within of the ocean during glacial period with lots of ice becomes more positive because there is more O18 compared to O16 in the ocean. And of course the reverse, if you have a greenhouse climate with no ice, then the delta O18 of the ocean is going to be lighter. And this is why we use oxygen isotope or we have used oxygen isotope for a long time in paleoclimate because it allows us to trace the fluctuation of ice sheets ten thanks to the composition of the ocean. But that's not the only thing that controls delta 18 in carbonate, unfortunately or fortunately, because when the carbonate precipitates, what determines the delta 18 of the, of the mineral is the composition of the fluid. So what is the initial composition of the fluid in terms of delta 18? 
but also the temperature at which the process of precipitation happens. So on this plot here from Dickinson et al., you can see that we have on the vertical axis temperature. On the horizontal axis, we have delta 18 of the water in small. And then you have those lines in the middle of the plot that have values attached to them. This is the composition of the calcite that would precipitate from a given temperature and a given delta 18 composition. And the calcite is expressed in PDB, not in SMO. And what's really apparent is that if you take one composition, here I just select minus 13 as an example composition for the calcite, you can see that you cannot really determine what was the delta 18 of the fluid and what was the temperature at which this, this uh, calcite precipitated because you have a range of paired temperature delta 18 of the fluid that would give rise to that minus 13 per mil composition. So usually what you do in a case like this is you guess one of the two parameters. So either you guess the delta 18 of the fluid or you guess the temperature and you can back calculate the other one. And that's fine if you know that you have marine water, for instance, it's, it's pretty easy to do. But when you have diagenetic fluids, you have a range of potential composition that makes it very difficult to apply this type of approach. So there's got to be a better way.